it's an honor to be here on behalf of our great team to tell you about the Knowledge Portal Network. So what I'd like to do today is, first of all, just give you a little bit of background and history on the project to, to give you an idea of why we wanted to make these knowledge portals and what, what do they do anyway? What are they for? And then give you an overview of what kinds of data can be um, access, accessed in the knowledge portals. What kinds of questions can you ask when you use them? Um, also for you computational people, how can you access these, access these data programmatically? Uh, and then just a little bit about what's in the future and how you can get involved. So this all started with a really simple idea that um, there were just uh, tons of genetic association um, and other genomic data, such as epigenomic annotations being amassed. And um, these were all in different places and not coordinated, not integrated. And the idea was that making these more integrated, more broadly accessible and, and interpretable could have a significant impact on um, how we understand human disease and, and find new drug targets. So that was the idea behind this project. Um, and at the time, about six years ago, um, there was a real opportunity and a big challenge in uh, type two di diabetes research in particular. Um, I'm sure I don't have to tell you that T2D is a, is a huge global health problem. And there was, and still is a very a large worldwide motivated um, research community in T2D. And uh, many independent signals were being identified. And today there are over 400. Back then there were maybe, I think, 100, but um, many independent signals anyway. And there was research necessary in, in many different areas, um, not only genetics, but also functional studies to, to understand what these genes do and how they're involved in diabetes. Um, and so in uh, about 2014 or 15, um, a collaboration started to address this issue, and it's um, the Accelerating Medicines Partnership in Type 2 Diabetes. It's a um, public-private partnership and involving NIH and the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health, FNIH, and pharmaceutical companies and the Broad, and other institutions such as uh, University of Michigan and um, uh, University of Oxford. So it, the, the mission was, um, first of all, um, to generate data, uh, genetic association data for T2D and its complications, <clears throat> and then through the portal to make this information more broadly accessible. And um, the, the ultimate goal was to speed up drug discovery. So the portal was launched in 2015, um, that this is an old, uh, one of the first versions of it, uh, an old screenshot, and this is what it looks like today. Um, and I, I will be telling you about what's, what's in it in a, in a little bit, but um, I just wanna kind of give you the, an overview of how the project has evolved. So of course, those opportunities and challenges were not uh, just um, relevant to T2D. There are many, many complex diseases for which many genetic association signals are being identified and we need to know the effector genes in order to understand how these diseases develop. Here's a little a table from the ICDA white paper, just, just uh, making that point that there are many other complex diseases um, that um, could benefit from such an effort to, to aggregate and um, integrate th these types of data. And um, as the knowledge, the T2D knowledge portal uh, progressed and uh, became known, we started to be approached from other disease communities. And so we started to expand beyond T2D. So in 2017, um, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Jonathan Roseanne and his colleagues and the American Heart Association and the International Stroke Genetics Consortium, we launched the Cerebrovascular Disease Knowledge Portal. And soon after, in the same year, in fact, um, we launched the Cardiovascular Disease Knowledge Portal in collaboration with Patrick Eleanor, St. Catharason, and, and many others at the Broad Institute. And we went on to expand to sleep disorders, um, collaborating with Richard Saxena and Jackie Lane, um, sleep and circadian uh, phenotypes, which, are, which can be related to cardiometabolic um, disease. And then finally, just last fall, we launched the Common Metabolic Diseases Knowledge Portal. And our, our project, our, our, our consortium has morphed from AMP T2D into AMP CMD. So um, Accelerating Medicines Partnership in Common Metabolic Diseases. 
And this project um, encompasses all of those um, disease areas that I just described. And this is kind of an Uber portal that, that uh, contains all of these traits. Um, in addition, we've branched out to a couple other portals that are not under the common metabolic diseases header. Um, we've recently launched a musculoskeletal knowledge portal in collaboration with Doug Keel and the International Federation of Musculoskeletal Research Societies. And um, just a couple weeks ago, we soft launched a new portal for lung disease in collaboration with Michael Cho and Benjamin Raby. So we've got a lot of portals. What's in them? Um, I, I should um, explain that although these portals are separate and they each have sort of disease community specific content, um, the, the data that they access is all in one big pot. So um, any portal can access any data if we, if we set it to do that. Um, and there are basically three types of data that are in these portals, genetic association data, functional genomic annotations, and the results of bioinformatic methods. So for genetic associations, um, and, and um, I should just remind you that these, these are data that, that link um, variant, variants in um, people's genotypes to the risk of having a disease or the likelihood of having a, a certain trait. So um, we have summary level um, genetic association statistics for over 300 data sets in, in our database. And they come from all over the world. The, the cohorts are from more than 50 countries and 100, more than 150 groups have contributed uh, this data. Um, about 10% of that is individual level genotype and sequence data, meaning um, that it, um, it is protected data. We can't show the individual level genotype data directly, of course, for because of privacy concerns, but we are making tools that can access it so that um, our, our displays and our tools can access it in a protected manner without um, compromising its privacy, but with allowing you to still do analyses um, on the data. So these data sets have genetic associations for more than 300 different traits and diseases. And we also um, have uh, incorporated curated credible sets for more than 40 traits. As far as functional genomic annotations. So these, these are annotations that delineate regions of the chromosome that have a potential for gene regulation um, of some kind. Um, most genetic associations are actually not in protein coding sequences. They're outside um, of those um, in the genome and they probably exert their effects through gene regulation. And so this, these epigenomic data are very important in trying to figure out how those variants exert their effects and what genes are their targets. Um, so the, these types of data are, um, for example, chromatin state, which measures, um, it, it's, it's, it's an algorithm that takes into account things like a histone modification and um, assigns a regulatory uh, state to a region of chromatin. There's also chromatin accessibility uh, from techniques such as attack seek, which looks at whether chromatin is, is open. And if it is, that, that indicates its uh, potential for transcription. Of course, transcription factor binding sites are, are very relevant to transcription. Um, and also, there are also data types such as chromatin conformation, which predicts things like um, contacts between enhancers and, and promoters. Um, and so, these, the, the graph here shows the types of data sets um, that, we, that we have and the tissues that they come from. And I forgot to mention at the start of this slide that all of this work is done in collaboration with the Diabetes Epigenome Atlas. So this is a project at um, University of California, San Diego. Um, in, it's led by Kyle Galton. And um, it runs, DGA, the database runs on the ENCODE software. If you're familiar with ENCODE, that's a large database of, of um, regulatory elements in, in the human genome. And so um, our procedure for incorporating functional genomic annotations is that they first go to DGA where they're processed and then sent to us. And then we process them further um, doing things like looking for enrichment of genetic associations in these epigenomic regions and for particular tissues of, that are relevant to disease. 
Um, the third type of information that's in the portals is the results of bioinformatic methods. So we, we have 12 methods now that we are either running uh, routinely or are, are working on and about to implement. Um, and I'll talk about these, these different methods as we go through the portal and I show you where they are. But basically the idea is that um, by, by integrating and using different algorithms on these genetic association and epigenomic data, you can make other make predictions and get more value. The synergy between the two types of data can, can give you new um, suggestions, new data um, on, uh, th that will help you figure out you know, what, what, how variants are actually working and in which tissues and on which genes do, do they act. Okay. So just to sum up what I said, um, our database has over 77 million variants right now. And it includes these three types of data from genetics, genomics, and uh, method results. And they all go into this, this uh, data and software platform that we're calling the huge AMP, <laughs> the Human Genetics Amplifier. And it's a, I'm not a software person, so I'm not going to give you the details of this, but it's, it's a cloud-based platform um, and it allows for federation. So um, we have uh, collaborators at, at, the, at EBI um, in England and they have some data that because of privacy, privacy concerns cannot be transferred to the US. But um, because of federation, uh, we can, our, our website can reach out to their, or our, excuse me, our database can reach out to them and uh, do calculations on the data and bring back the results which are, which are uh, protected. So the federation mechanism allows us to be, to be worldwide um, in a secure way. And then, um, so the huge AMP platform aggregates the data, analyzes them, and, and finally prepares them for representation on the portal. Okay, and now I wanna to switch to a live demonstration and show you what the CMDKP is like. Okay, so here is the homepage of the CMDKP. Um, and before we get started, I just wanted to give you a little bit of general orientation. Um, the disease specific portals that I spoke of, you can navigate to those from here by just clicking on disease specific portals and then um, choosing any one and you will, you will go to that portal. Um, and as I said, there is some disease community specific content on each portal. And also um, there's a subset of the data that are in the CMDKP. So if you wanna have a really more focused view and just look at a few traits and diseases that are most directly relevant to that disease area, the disease specific portal is, is where you would do that. I also forgot to mention that we have launched um, a new portal in addition to the ones I showed you that evolved over the years, when we created the CMDKP, we also launched a portal for type one diabetes, which is something new and that's, that is in progress. Okay, so, and it's just a couple things um, on this page. There's a contact form. We always appreciate getting questions and suggestions. So please contact us this way. And a good way to keep up with, with what's happening is this what's new section, which is just new uh, news items every once in a while. You can also sign up to get our quarterly newsletter and occasional updates. We don't, we don't blast you with emails. Um, and yeah, one more thing before I dive in is that I want to show you our page of genetic association data sets. So these hundreds of data sets that I told you about are all listed here. And this is pretty overwhelming, but you can narrow them down by, um, by trait. So you can choose a group of phenotypes that you're interested in and then um, choose a, you know, another, a sub, a more granular phenotype, and you'll see the list of the data sets that include genetic associations for that phenotype. So let's see. Okay, so let's just um, start by asking a question. I think most people who come to the portal are interested in a particular gene. So um, what can I learn about my gene of interest? Maybe I've got a, a mouse knockout that has an interesting phenotype and I, it may be relevant to disease and I wanna see what's known about the human homologue. Um, or I've just been working on this gene in the lab, it's in a pathway that I work on. Um, so what's known about the genetics of it? So let's just um, type in a gene name. 
when you type in a gene name here on the home page, you go to um, one of our core pages of the, the portal. Uh, this is called the region page. And when you first go to this page, it displays the coding sequence of the gene um, and 50 kilobases on either side. And uh, just for purposes of this demonstration, I'm going to expand it. You can just click this button to look at a slightly larger range. Okay, so these are the genes that are in this region. Um, as I scroll down below, you'll see that we have a genome browser that will show you that also. Um, but here is a, this section just kind of summarizes what's going on um, in, as far as genetic associations in this region. So let me just get a drink. So there, there are two things to know about the associations shown here. One is that um, they are meta-analyzed. So as I said, we have you know, 300 data sets. Um, so any given phenotype in the portal may have you know, 10 data sets um, for, the, for which there are genetic associations for that phenotype. Rather than present results from each individual data set, we meta-analyze um, them together. And uh, we use a method called METAL, an algorithm developed at University of Michigan. <clears throat> and it um, has a way to um, correct for statistically inferred overlap, sample overlap between the data sets. This is important because um, many of the cohorts studied in these, in these uh, data sets that we have are, are overlapping. So uh, it is really important to account for sample overlap to, when you do meta-analysis. And so meta-analysis does a couple of things. Um, First of all, it kind of gives us a consensus, you know, best p-value for an association rather than looking at 10 data sets, 10 different p-values, which one do I trust? Um, Meta-analysis kind of gives us a consensus p-value. Um, and, but also it can actually um, suggest new associations because for example, if many um, data sets have a, um, a suggestive signal, if meta, uh, the, com the combination of those data sets in meta-analysis can, can uh, boost that signal to, to you know, look more significant, um, to, to suggest that it, it might be worth investigating. And similarly, um, meta-analysis can, can suggest that some signals are, are really spurious. Um, perhaps there's a, a significant looking signal, but it's only in one small data set. And then um, there are other large data sets that don't have it. Um, that, the the meta-analysis bumps that one down and says it's probably not worth looking at that one any further. So most of the associations that we show in the portal are, are meta-analyzed. And in addition, um, in this display, we are doing LD clumping to reduce the complexity of what you're looking at. So LD is linkage disequilibrium. It just means um, that genetic linkage between variants that are located close to each other on the chromosome. So whenever we have a genetic association signal, typically there's not just one variant that's associated with the trait or disease. There are a bunch of them, they're all together and they, they all may have very significant p-values, but really generally only one of these is the causal variant for that, that association. The others are just along for the ride because they happen to be inherited together with that variant. So, what we're doing then is grouping these associations into clumps um, by, by their genetic linkage. And um, here in this table, each of these rows represents a clump. And so we're showing the lead variant, which is uh, the one that is the most significantly associated with the phenotype. And then if you wanna see all the variants that are in that clump, you can, you can hit that button. And yeah, you can see this is, a, this is a very large clump. All these variants are linked together. Okay, so um, this display just shows you um, across the region, what are the phenotypes that are most, um, th this, th okay, in this graphic, these are the genome-wide significantly associated phenotypes, which means that their p-value is less than five times 10 to the minus eight. Scrolling down a little further, here's the variance in region table. So this table just shows um, all the variants. They're not clumped and the phenotype shown is the one that is most significantly associated in this region. Um, and I'll show you later that you can add phenotypes to this table, but let's keep on going down a little further. So this module is um, experimental. It's still under development. It's not, um, it's not fully there yet. We'd love to have suggestions on this, um, 
but it, it's, it's getting there. It's getting to be quite useful. So what you're seeing here is, first of all, this is a, a locus zoom plot. You're probably all familiar with this. It's just a plot of the genetic associations across this region with this phenotype type 2 diabetes. And if you mouse over a variant, you will see its ID. And um, the, yeah, the, the y-axis is the significance of, of its genetic association. And here's a genome browser, so we know where in the genome we are. So you can add lots of information to this display. Um, and first of all, let's add a credible set. So credible sets are, um, are sets of variants um, that collectively have um, a, a certain probability of including the causal variant. And each variant in the credible set is assigned a posterior probability, which, which gives the likelihood that it is the causal variant. So here now, okay, this is not very user-friendly yet. Um, it's hard to tell which credible set is which, but I happen to know this is a, a curated credible set from a large T2D study. So I'm gonna show that. Um, and here's the credible set and this almost off the charts here. This is, this is uh, just one causal variant in this credible set. So that must has a very high posterior probability of one in fact. And if we, using these crosshairs on locus zoom, we can see that this variant is the same as the lead variant in, in, this, uh, in this cluster here. So that's, that's informative. Um, that's, that looks like a variant of interest. Now, um, these menus allow you to add epigenomic annotations. So we're looking at type two diabetes, um, and let's see, this, this variant is outside of a gene. It, it you know, should have some regulatory potential, I'm guessing. So let's, let's look at um, enhancers. Let's add annotations for enhancers and see what we get. So this display shows where there are uh, in, enhancers. This is the chromatin state called enhancer active two. Um, and if we split the tracks, we can see which tissues these are in. And let's get the crosshair again over this variant of interest. Um, yes, it actually, uh, it's, the variant is in an enhancer region in pancreas, which is a, obviously a very relevant region for type two diabetes. Let's try adding a, um, maybe a tissue. Um, let's add liver because that's also very relevant for diabetes. I'm gonna close this one up and Another, another trick is that you can filter by enrichment um, to, to reduce the complexity of this. So uh, I should have explained more. These regions are um, regions that, that are enriched. They are, um, they are genomic regions where there are epigenomic annotations and uh, we're measuring the enrichment of genetic association signals for this phenotype type two diabetes in those regions. So that's what the p-value and, and fold enrichment refer to. Um, it is how enriched is this region in genetic associations for our phenotype of interest. And so when we're looking at liver now, let's split the tracks again and put the crosshair over this variant. Oop. Okay. And yeah, again, we can see, we're seeing accessible chromatin and um, an active enhancer in liver also. So this is very um, suggestive that this variant might have regulatory potential in type two diabetes. And in fact, it does. Um, this variant was studied um, a few years ago by um, Kyle Galton, Karen Mulkey and others. And it turns out this variant um, alters a, a trans transcription factor binding site in, in this region. And so, it um, likely affects the regulation of the neighboring genes. And so that's, um, that all makes sense. But if you were coming to this, you know, from not knowing that ahead of time, obviously, this could suggest to you um, if a variant of interest, you know, seems to have um, possible regulatory potential um, and could suggest that it might be a good one to look at more closely. Okay, and uh, later I'll show you another interface we have in, in the works that will let you explore this type of issue in e even more depth. <clears throat> okay, so um, let's see. Let, let's continuing as someone who is interested in the gene particularly, let's look at a gene page. Gene pages have um, obviously gene-specific 
information. Um, and here are shown common variant associations. So these are associations from genotypes that, that look at common uh, variants. Uh, and this, this graph shows um, the associations of the aggregate variants in the whole gene with these different phenotypes. And that is done using the MAGMA algorithm. And so you can see um, that also generates a p-value and you can see the number of variants that went into the analysis. And so you can see that according to the MAGMA algorithm, this gene is um, significantly associated with, with several different phenotypes. <clears throat> Down here, we have rare variant gene level associations. These come from an exome sequencing study. And so yeah, exome sequencing can detect rare variants. And um, there are, um, this is from a study by Jason Flanick and colleagues um, where the, the, it's from exome sequencing of about 50,000 people. And um, you can, there's a lot of detail here that I'm not gonna go into now, but there are different sets of variants and you can look at the aggregate gene level scores from, from the different sets. Okay. Um, Let's see, now I'm gonna briefly show you a really experimental tool that can give you some information about a gene. So we have this section, a KP Labs. I, I don't know if any of you remember Google Labs. It was a um, you know, part of, when you went to Google, you could use their new uh, in-development tools uh, in Google Labs. And so I don't think Google Labs exists anymore, but we've, we decided to have, to make KP Labs because we have a lot of tools that are really, they could be useful. We want people to try them, and they're, but they're still in development. So they're not really you know, ready for prime time, but, but it would be great to, it's great to get them out there and have people playing with them. So this one is the huge calculator, human genetic evidence calculator. Um, and it, the idea behind this one is that it can, it's hard to, it's hard to evaluate genetic evidence. If you're just like coming to the portal and looking at different interfaces, you know, what does that really mean? I, I, I'd like to know, you know, what it suggests. Does this really mean my gene is involved in this disease, or is it, you know, I don't know. I don't know how to evaluate it. That's that's the the motivation for this. So um, the tool can kind of give you a score for evaluating genetic support for for your gene of interest. Um, and also, I wanted to mention that. Uh, this was developed by Peter Dornbos in uh, Jason Flanick's lab. And um, he and Jason gave a webinar a little while ago that was really well attended. There's a lot of interest in this. And the, the webinar recording is available on our site if you're interested in hearing more detail about this tool. So let's just put in a gene. Um, so you select a gene, and then you select the phenotype you're interested in. And the calculator runs. And there's a lot of information here. And I'm, I'm not gonna have time to go over the details, but um, I will just say that it looks at rare variation from um, exome sequencing. It looks from common variation from genome-wide association studies. Um, it does some calculations, which you can adjust. Um, and it gives you um, sort of a, a bottom line, uh, you know, best guess that, okay, this is saying the evidence for the involvement of this gene in type two diabetes is compelling. So uh, we're really interested in people's feedback on this tool. So I, I hope you'll give it a try with, with your favorite gene and your favorite phenotype. All right, one more uh, thing on the gene level. Um, I wanna show you how you can do um, aggregation tests, interactive aggregation tests. So, um, okay, this is our genetic association interactive tool. And this will give you a gene level association score um, by running an aggregation test. You can start with selecting a gene and I'll just use the same one. Um, the masks refers to, this is a little bit cryptic here and we're, we need to um, make it more obvious what these masks refer to. They're described, um, in the paper that describes the exome sequencing, but um, we will be making this more obvious, but I'm gonna choose a mask. So this is this just filters variants by their impact on the coding sequence of this gene. Um, so this gives us a set of variants with their impact. And now we're going to run an aggregation test 
on this set of variants to see what is how does the gene score. Um, and so there are two data sets available right now. Um, we have exome sequencing, as I mentioned, from that, the, that set, but we also are, have incorporated some top med whole genome sequencing information. So select a data set, and then you can select several phenotypes if you want. And we also have four different test methods, um, and you can select all of them. So you can, this is really uh, a time saver if you want to look at results from many different tests. Um, which one did I forget here? There we go. You can, you can just run them all at the same time. You can run multiple phenotypes and just, just get a nice table of, of the results. So this gives you the, the um, aggregate gene level association scores for your gene and your phenotype. Okay, um, yeah, and I should mention here that, yes, I said we, we have the top med whole genome sequencing available to, to query here, but and we're, what we're working on is uh, we're building software that can generate summary information, uh, some summary representations of protected data. So we're working with Biodata Catalyst to try to um, get this going for all top med whole genome sequencing in a with a variety of phenotypes. Okay, and so what if you are not interested in a particular gene, but you want to know what might be the effector genes for a phenotype of choice? So um, this is a really important part of our project is to um, create and curate <clears throat> and maintain lists of the likeliest effectors for disease, because these are, these are the genes that um, it makes sense for researchers to put time and effort into, into working on, um, the possible drug targets. So as of now, we, most of our, the predictions that we have are for type two diabetes, because that's where we've started. And we have three different methods at the moment. Um, so one of them is just a, a curated list. I'll show you that. Um, from Anuba Mahajan and Mark McCarthy, where they looked um, pretty much manually at um, several different types of genetic, regulatory, and um, mutant phenotype evidence to score genes <clears throat> for their potential to be um, involved in type 2 diabetes. And they gave scores like uh, causal, um, strong, possible, you know, different, different uh, categories. Um, denoting the likelihood that they are involved in type 2 diabetes. And so this is an interactive table where you can explore that and sort it and also look at all the evidence behind it, behind each prediction. So that, um, that is the curated list. And then we have a couple of different methods which are more automated. Um, one of them is called the effector index. Um, this is from Brent Richards group and their method is run not only for type 2 diabetes, but also for a bunch of other phenotypes. And we're now working on automated, automating this within our database so that it can take the data that, that we have and um, regenerate um, these for predictions of effectors, not only for these phenotypes, but basically for any phenotype that we have in the database. So that will be really um, interesting to look at. And um, the third method that we have is, um, from right here at the Broad, um, from Elisa Manning's group with Tim Majerian, and th their method is called integrated classifier predictions, and these are these are for type two diabetes. So this, as I said, is an important activity, an important um, product of the portal that we're going to be uh, working on harder in the future. So that that kind of summarized. Well, at a very superficial level, um, what you might look at if you are if you're coming to the portal interested in a gene. Um, and another major question I think that people come to the portal is, I'm interested in a, a phenotype or a disease. What what do I know? Um, but you know, what can I find out about the genes that are involved and the variants that are involved in that phenotype? So let's let's take a look at what you can do that way. So let's look at LDL LDL cholesterol as a phenotype. So. Oh yeah, I meant to look at HDL, that's right, sorry. Let's look at HDL, oops. Okay, so the phenotype page summarizes what is known about that phenotype. 
Um, and the Manhattan plot shows um, those bottom line meta-analyzed associations across the genome for this phenotype. So I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with a Manhattan plot, but the, this, the x-axis is the chromosomes as if they were laid end to end, and the y-axis is the significance of the association. So uh, yeah, HDL cholesterol has, has um, a few extremely, extremely strong associations across the genome. Um, and here on the phenotype page, we have um, a table of the top single variant associations for this phenotype. So the, these are the top loci. Again, these are LDL clumped so that these um, variants that are listed here are the strongest variant within a clump. Um, so that, that gives you an idea of where in the genome these, these are located. And uh, I should mention that for almost any table in uh, the, the database, if you wanna download the whole thing, there's a button where you can do that. You can download it and uh, manipulate it however you like. <clears throat> um, on the phenotype page, there's also a table of the genes that are most strongly associated with that phenotype on the gene level. And again, these are generated using the MAGMA algorithm. And finally, um, the, as I said, this, these associations are meta-analyzed. Uh, you might wonder which database, which uh, data sets went into this meta-analysis. How, how did you know? How did we do it? What? How many data sets were there for this trait? And so this, that's what this table shows you. And uh, there are obviously a lot of data sets that have um, HDL cholesterol associations, but you, you can see them all here. And if you click on any one of the data set names, it will take you to a data set page that gives you complete information about that data set. Um, and finally, here's a table of annotations, epigenomic annotations that are globally enriched for um, associations with HDL cholesterol and in which tissues. And so you can see that there are some tissues that make a lot of sense here, cardiovascular system, adipose tissue, and liver. Okay, um, another uh, way to approach this, if you are interested in the phenotype, is to use a tool called the Gene Finder. So this tool lets you start with a phenotype. And then it brings up all the genes that are associated with that phenotype, again, um, using magma. Um, and you can add multiple phenotypes. So you can see, um, let's see. So you can find out if there are genes that are associated you know, with both phenotypes of interest, for example. And you can keep on adding phenotypes to, to look at multiples. All right, so um, what if you are more into computation? You just wanna get a bunch of data and analyze it yourself rather than looking at these tables and inter interfaces on, on the website. Well, we have a solution for you too. Um, first of all, so this is called Lunaris. It's a, it's a tool to, to retrieve data um, from, uh, from the cloud. And there's a couple ways to get that data. So first of all, I'm, I just went to a region page. If you're interested in data uh, just for a particular region and a particular phenotype, you can go to that region page. And then this is the Lunaris icon at the top. You can click download data with Lunaris API. And this takes, this takes a little while. It's not as lightning fast as the rest of our, our website, um, but it, it will come up. <laughs> and there we go. So, and you can, you can copy this and download it. So this gives you the information for all the associations across this region with this phenotype um, that is set for the page, LDL. And if you want to get those for a different phenotype, all you need to do is to mouse over a phenotype name and then set to this phenotype this sets the whole page to this phenotype. And now if you do Lunaris, it will download the data for that phenotype. Um, what if you're interested in a, in a broader query or a more sort of batch type query? Um, well, we have a Lunaris landing page. You can get to the, the tool itself. Um, so this, this page documents Lunaris and at the bottom there's a section describing exactly what, what are the data you can access and uh, when they were updated. But th there's a standalone version of Lunaris. Um, and this is 
This is for the real computational people. I'm not going to even try to explain it, but you can, you can put in different regions and so forth and different traits and, and come up with, all, with a lot of data, both association data and, and epigenomic annotation data. All right, I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint now and just make a few more points. Yeah, let me give you a little bit of a preview of our, some of our future plans. So as I said, effector gene lists are very important and are we, it's one of our highest priorities to predict effectors for more diseases. And we're interested in both in getting curated lists from respective disease research communities and also, as I said, implementing some of these automated methods internally so we can run them and update them regularly on our data. Um, and as far as the curated lists, um, we are in the process of working with um, Krishna Aragam and Adam Butterworth from the Cardiogram Consortium. They've got a method um, to prioritize cardiovascular risk genes, and we are, we are looking to um, uh, present that their list of effectors as soon as, as they're ready to do that. Um, we also definitely want to integrate a lot more functional genomics results. Um, we're working, a, a focus right now is working on um, co-localization of EQTLs and genetic associations. This can be really revealing for, um, for prioritizing variants and understanding which, which ones are, uh, are uh, important. And I just saw a Q&A. Sarah, is there something that I should stop and talk about now? Sure, yes, there was just a, a, a question um, from Dr. Hensicker asking whether you have any pointers or a quick example of how you can access individual level data in the portal and what kind of analyses you can do with the individual level data. Mm. I should have mentioned that the aggregation tests um, access individual level data. So that's, that, uh, that is the main, the main point of access for, for individual level data right now. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, for functional genomics, um, we also in the future want to add results of experimental work such as you know, CRISPR knockouts and so forth. And um, as I mentioned, our consortium has morphed from AMP T2D into AMP common metabolic diseases. And along with this project, there are um, a couple of awards, um, including some at the Broad that um, to, to our collaborators to general functional to generate functional genomic results for potential effector genes for type 2 diabetes. And so they are going to be doing a lot of the, this uh, functional work and we'll be integrating their results into the portal. Um, okay, we also plan to add more interactive visualizations. And here's an example. I realize you're not going to be able to really see this. Um, and it's just, a, it's just a drawing at this point. It's, it's a, an interface that is in progress. But um, this, uh, we're calling it the variant minor provisionally right now. This will um, allow custom views of variants and uh, their tissue enrichments and posterior probabilities. So the idea is, as I showed you, um, in that locus zoom visualization, you might have a whole group of variants and you want to be sure, you know, which, is the, which are the ones that, that could be um, most relevant, which do I want to study further. And this is a way to go from that visualization and here actually dig in even deeper to see more information about these variants. So that's, that's in the works. Um, okay, also we, as I said, we're going. We're expanding our platform so we can operate on top of data commons resources like Terra and BioData Catalyst. Um, and then I also wanted to mention another portal, the Variant to Function portal, um, knowledge which is internal to the Broad at this point, um, and it's meant to um, to serve the V2F community at the Broad, and it. Uh, it also aggregates, analyzes, and representing, re represents the results from the V2F projects at the Broad, as well as all the other data that I've just described. And we have another question. Yes, uh, there's a question from Dr. Zhu asking, um, just saying thank you for your wonderful presentation and asking for a little more information about fine mapping of variants um, within a particular gene of interest using this resource. Um, okay, let me, I, I think, I'll, let me just finish um, this part and then I will go back to, I'll take that as a question at the end of it, but that's, I can certainly talk more about that. Um, okay, let's see, I'm sorry, my mouse is skipping. All right, so 
um, we really want to encourage you to contribute your results and your methods to the knowledge portals. So there are um, advantages to, to you as well as to the whole community. Um, you can share um, what your research community sees as the authoritative results. And when you, your summary st statistics are incorporated into the knowledge portals, you can see them um, analyzed and displayed and integrated, not just as a, as a file of, of summary stats. Uh, you can compare your results to other similar data sets easily. And also um, the data in the database have many bioinformatics methods run on them, as I said. So you can see the results of those methods on your data set. And also if you have a novel method um, that would be interesting, uh, we would conceivably incorporate that and then um, it would be run on all the, the, these data sets and traits that we have. So that could be that could be useful. So we really encourage collaboration. And yeah, just finally, um, please stay in touch. We really do like to hear from people who are using the portal and, and get feedback about how it can be better. So as I said, on the homepage, there's a contact link, there's uh, news items, and there's an email list. Um, we also have quarterly webinars. Our next one is on May 13th. And uh, those are announced in the, in the What's News section on the homepage. And then we're on Twitter and LinkedIn. So that's, that's the summary. And finally, before I... I um, break for questions that um, this we have a, a great team and this is these are all the wonderful people who have contributed to this effort and it's just it's a real team effort and um, it's a lot of fun. So okay now I have, we'll go back to that question about fine mapping. Let's see. Okay so um, we don't have tools that will allow you to find map, but we do calculate credible sets. So um, let's see, let's go back to our region page. Um, the way to access credible sets at the moment is to is through this genomic region minor um, interface and any credible sets that are um, that, that include this region that you're looking at will be listed here. And so the curated credible sets we have are, um, first of all, we have um, type two diabetes credible sets um, from Mahajan et al. from a very large uh, uh, T2D genetic association study. And then we also have uh, curated credible sets for 40 traits from UK Biobank, um, from Jacob Ulrich here at the Broad. Um, and so those are loaded in here for those 40 traits. And then for all other traits, um, well, for all traits, we also calculate credible sets dynamically. So this is, this is where you can um, access them here and, and load them into the, the interface. Did that answer the question? That was great, thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, I believe Diane also has a question. I do. Thanks. Thanks very much, Sarah. And, and thanks, Maria, again, for this really wonderful talk. Um, I have a, a general question about um, the sorts of strategies for developing a portal of this sort, which from your presentation is really clear, massively increases the, the value of any particular data set as a, as a tool for discovery. Um, I'm working on a project to discover the genomic basis of disease in species that are housed in zoos with the goal of supporting human medicine and conservation biology. And one major challenge that I had vastly underestimated, but I am reminded of every single day, is that the individual phenotype data are very often stored at multiple different zoos in Excel files on someone's computer. And the genomic data are newly being collected elsewhere. And bringing all these data sets together is both essential for you know, pairing genotype and phenotype and hugely challenging. And so I wonder if you perhaps have some general guidance on um, sort of establishing collaborative work toward a portal like the ones you've described in fields that are really very much earlier in their development? Hmm. Well, <laughs> I think if you want to collect information, it's helpful to kind of set expectations for the people who are giving it to you. Um, so, you know, if you can, I think the more guidance you can give them in terms of specifying the types of information you'd like to see and, you know, maybe the formats that you'd like to see it in, that can be helpful because it, it can eliminate a lot of back and forth, you know, trying to figure out what, what was this that you sent me and, you know, um, so that's, that's one suggestion. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I just, it's, it really helps to be part of a community that uh, values data sharing. And I mean, it, it sounds like your, your community would, I'm sure you're all really committed to conservation and, um, 
just emphasizing that that you know this type of data sharing is really important, um, and just just kind of creating an ethos where where it's just normal that whenever you get data, of course you're going to share it. Um, yeah, that's that's really helpful too, and that has developed in the T2D community over time. It didn't you know it wasn't uh, a sharing community maybe ten years ago I think, but it certainly is now. That, that's that last part in particular about it not having been a sharing community is really really helpful to hear because I think that um, that I, I would certainly agree is going to be essential and um, different fields I think have different histories with regard to how data sharing works and um, thank you for <laughs> emphasizing that yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for having me. Take care, everyone. <laughs>